and welcome to the channel. If you are new here, then hi, my name is Brittany and I am a nurse practitioner. If you are a returning subscriber, then welcome back. I'm so happy to have you here as always. Much of the content that I create here on this channel, it's educational, not only for the licensed nurse practitioner, but of course also nurse practitioner students as well. As you may know, I have completed multiple different nurse practitioner boards reviews. I have used YouTube, I've collaborated with another company called Archer, and I've just gone at my content again one more time trying to revamp it and deliver it to you again as the most affordable option out there. I'm using YouTube and Patreon. Uh, so for today's lecture, we're gonna be talking all about mental health for the AANP and the ANCC exams. However, on YouTube, this video here is a shortened version. To get access to the complete video and the complete audio files for the Nurse Practitioner Licensing Exam, then follow the link in the description box below, which will take you to my Patreon. The total review course does not launch until February 27th, in which you pay for monthly access. But of course, please enjoy this free video to help you study and to access again those complete audio files. Make sure you become a patron and join the tier titled ANCC and AANP exam prep course on my Patreon. Again, that complete course does not fully launch until February 27th. I just want to make sure and give you guys a sneak peek, of course, of what's to come and a little build up until the launch. Without further delay, let's just dive into today's topic all about mental health for the nurse practitioner licensing exam. All right, so let's start with depression. So depression is the most common mental health disorder and it's seen frequently in primary care. And so of course we need to know how to diagnose depression. So the diagnosis of unipolar depression is made in a patient that has a history of one or more major depressive episode and without a history of mania. So we need to know what is defined as a major depressive episode. So we can look at the DSM-5 and they give us a definition for this. So the DSM-5 defines a major depressive episode as five or more of the following symptoms for at least two consecutive weeks and at least one of those symptoms has to be either depressed mood or a loss of interest or pleasure and this is also known as anhedonia. So defining symptoms include a depressed mood most of the day, loss of pleasure in activities, insomnia, psychomotor retardation, fatigue, decreased ability to concentrate, feelings of worthlessness, sleep disturbances, a 5% or more uh, weight change in less than one month or a decrease in appetite, and then finally recurrent thoughts of death and or suicide. So screenings for depression, we have the PHQ-2 and the PHQ-9. These are questionnaires that help, of course, to screen our patients. The PHQ PHQ-2 asks the patient two questions. So it asks, during the past two weeks, have you often been bothered by feeling down and depressed or hopeless? And during the past two weeks, have you often been bothered by having a little interest or pleasure in doing things? So a yes to either one of those questions is considered a positive finding. And so of course, then we need to further evaluate and we can use the PHQ-9. So the PHQ-9, this has nine questions to screen for depression. It has an 88% sensitivity and specificity, and it's also required by Medicare for nursing homes. So additional questions that are included, included in the PHQ-9 include um, regarding appetite, difficulties with sleeping, t trouble concentrating, and all of this, again, you could just Google this and look it up. It's uh, public knowledge, and I definitely do recommend that you review this before going into practice and obviously, too, for your board's exam. The first line treatment for unipolar major depression is psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy. So selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, those are, are the first line agent. Also serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, atypical antidepressants, serotonin modulators, um, all of these are reasonable alternatives, but it's common practice to start with an SSRI for the treatment of unipolar depression and then venture out if that's ineffective. So examples of medications that belong to the SSRIs include citalopram, this is Celexa, sertraline or Zoloft, paroxetine or Paxil, and then finally fluoxetine or Prozac. 
It's preferred to start these drugs at a low dose to reduce the likelihood of negative side effects, and the patient should notice improvement of their depressive symptoms within two weeks of starting the medicine. Uh, for pregnancy and depression, the safest options would be sertraline and sertraline. Um, agents that we should avoid during pregnancy would be fluoxetine and paroxetine. Uh, side effects associated with SSRIs include GI symptoms, predominantly diarrhea, also weight gain, sexual dysfunction, and then an increased bleeding risk if there is concurrent use with an anticoagulant. So key points when prescribing SSRIs is to make sure to screen the patient for bipolar disorder first. And this is because if a patient is incorrectly diagnosed with depression they, and they actually have bipolar, the initiation of an SSRI could actually trigger a manic episode. Um, it's also important to educate a patient that if they decide to stop taking an SSRI, to taper that drug very slowly because abruptly stopping these medications can cause something called discontinuation syndrome. And this can cause dizziness, fatigue, headache, nausea, and agitation. It's uh, typically recommended to treat with antidepressants for six to 12 weeks uh, before deciding either to continue treatment or to change the therapy. For patients that experience some relief but not total relief, it's suggested to add on a second agent. So for example, the literature says start with a second generation antipsychotic as a first step up add-on treatment. So examples of this would be eriprazole, uh, brexprazole, quetapine, risperidone. Those are all of the options that are listed in the literature. Uh, for patients that don't respond to second generation antipsychotics for that adjunct therapy, Sometimes lithium is also used as adjunct treatment. Um, another reasonable alternative for adjunct treatment would be the addition of buspirone or Wellbutrin. Uh, this belongs to the drug class norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitors. Let's talk a little bit more about lithium because there are some really important points regarding this. So the reason that I need to bring special attention to lithium is because this has a very narrow therapeutic range, and so of course it requires uh, careful monitoring from the healthcare providers. So the target serum level for lithium is between 0.8 and 1.2, and so you can see that's extremely narrow. Uh, lithium toxicity, uh, this can lead to severe side effects and multi-system dysfunction. It can ultimately be fatal if it's not recognized. So mild toxicity, this typically occurs once the lithium reaches a level of 1.5. Levels of 2.5 are higher. These constitute as a medical emergency, even if they're relatively asymptomatic. Um, if lithium toxicity is present, patients can present uh, with GI symptoms, so nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Those neurological symptoms, they can be seen too, such as confusion, agitation, seizures, but these don't typically de develop until later on in that clinical course. And that's why it's just so important for us to look at the whole picture when evaluating your patient. If they're having, you know, these nonspecific GI symptoms, you might not be thinking lithium toxicity unless, of course, you rever reviewed their medications and see that they are on this medicine, in which case you would delve further into that and see if that is indeed what's going on with your patient.